What is theory? What is criticism? What is the difference between the two? Why are they necessary in learning literature? What exactly do we have to learn there? And most importantly, how can you learn it in an easy way? These are some of the questions in the minds of many literature students. In this video with Ace the English Hub, we discuss these troubling questions and find simple solutions. First, let's see why we need to study theory and criticism. People are meaning-making machines. Any work of art we see, we automatically look for its meaning. How many times have we looked at a painting or listened to a song and said, it makes no sense, what does it mean? Theory and criticism originated from that universal human tendency of seeking meaning. So, how do they help us in creating meaning? Theory and criticism tell us what to look for in a text. A common reader might miss the hidden meanings in a text. Knowledge of theory will help you become aware. To look for certain clues that provide new meanings to a text. It helps you to interpret a text. A work of criticism will tell you the worth of a certain text. It will provide insight to the readers on what books to read and what you can afford to miss. Now, I have used these words theory and criticism in the last two minutes of this video. But what are they? Is there a difference between the two? If so, what is the difference? And most importantly, what came first, theory or criticism? The word theory came from the Greek word theorine, meaning to look at. It was frequently used in terms of looking at a theatre stage. The word criticism comes from the Greek word kritis, meaning judge. Theory organizes and explains, whereas criticism does the analysis, interpretation and evaluation. Theories lead to critical approaches and critical approaches are needed to create new theories. Literary theory is abstract. It is an idea, a set of rules, whereas literary criticism is action. To understand this in a simple way, let's first discuss what came first, theory or criticism. Theory in fact existed right from the days of Plato. Theories or studies of art and literature were done from an early age. For example, Aristotle's theory about tragedy helped dramatists in the Elizabethan age. Longinus and Horace's theories in poetry helped many poets in various ages of English literature. However, we study them under the title of criticism. This is to differentiate it from modern literary theory, what we know as theory. The theory we study now gradually developed in Europe during the 19th century. Let's look at theory in detail. We might have also heard of terms like literary theory or critical theory. Theory is not specific to literature alone. It exists in the fields of psychology, philosophy, sociology, etc. When you apply these theories to works of literature, we call it literary theory or critical theory. It is a body of ideas and methods we use in the practical reading of literature. There are two aspects of theory. The first one is prescription. It teaches you how literature should be produced. And the second one, description. It teaches you the principles underlying literature. Theory is how we read and where to look around for answers and explanations because we cannot call Wordsworth or Shakespeare and ask what they meant. An important point to understand while learning theory is that it is not a doctrine that has to be followed religiously. It is a mere tool to read works. We all know Emma Abrams. Abrams in his work, The Mirror and the Lamp, notes down the four elements that make up theory. And according to this framework, there are four kinds of theories. The first one is mimetic theory. It is the oldest category of theory. 
Theories that fit in this category believe that the artist is an imitator of aspects of the observable universe. The theories of Socrates and Plato come under the mimetic theory. We all remember Plato's theory of mimesis, that art is an imitation of life and that idea is the ultimate reality. The second one is pragmatic theory. The theory is concerned with the relation between the text and the audience. The focus is on the social didactic functions of art to teach and to please. These theories were dominant from the time of Horace to the early 19th century. Third one is expressive theory. With the romantic age and the idea of expressive view of art, the primary duty of the artist became making one's inner life the primary subject of art. The fourth one is objective theory. This theory has been the dominant mode of criticism of the 20th century. The focus here is on the analysis of the work in isolation. We can classify all the theories that we know into these four frameworks. Now, let us look at the major critical theories and how we apply each theory to literature. Let's understand them in the simplest language. Formalism and New Criticism focused on the study of literature on a scientific basis through objective analysis. You look at the form of a work, rhymes used, meter, irony, paradox, setting, characterization, plot, everything you see inside the text. Reader Response Theory believes that every written work has a gap that needs to be filled in by the reader. A text's understanding depends on the reader, his experience and his thought process. You and I will read a particular text, but what we understand from the text will vary depending on our experience and thought process. Marxist philosophy or Marxist literary theory exposes the events or references of class struggles, exploitation of the poor and the working class in a work. Feminism understands texts with women-centric perspectives. Feminists believe that the concept of gender is constructed by society. Feminism has widened its horizon now to include the issues of the queer community as well. Structuralism believed that nothing can exist in isolation. There is always a similarity we can find in the construction of any work. Structuralism will tell you that almost all the movies we love have the same basic storyline. Post-structuralism could be the trickiest of them all. It tells you that every aspect of human experience is textual. A text can have multiple meanings and also that meaning is always postponed. Deconstruction and postmodernism are approaches to poststructuralism. Let's see an example to understand the basic tenet of poststructuralism. When you use the signifier ring, the idea that it creates in our mind can be many. We might think of a diamond ring or gold ring, a ring we saw on a TV commercial, or a ring one of our friends was wearing, or even the movie The Ring. Ring could also give us the idea of commitment, completeness or love. When you use the word ring, the meaning can be at any of these points. Psychoanalytic theory is based on Freud's study that the human mind has three fundamental structures, the it, the ego and the superego. When applied to literature, psychoanalytic theory focuses on the role of consciousness and unconsciousness in literature. And last, post-colonial theory focuses on the influence of colonialism. Consider all these theories as different colored lenses. You can look at a given work using any of these lenses. Each lens or each theory will open up to you a different perspective of looking at a work. Remember that in this action you are now applying the theory to a work and we have moved on to criticism. Now before we move on to explain what criticism is, let us also see what is post-theory. 
Literary theory or high theory was prevalent during the 1960s to 80s in the US. The post-Deridian period has opened to a new idea called post-theory, which believes that all theories are passé. People felt that literary theory was redundant, canonical and took the pleasure away from reading literature. Post theory urges us to look at marginalized texts and stresses on the idea that literature is for enjoyment too. Let's move on to literary criticism. We must have read or watched reviews of movies in newspapers or YouTube. Reviews are criticisms too, in a way. But literary criticism is much more than simple reviews. The act of critically interpreting any literary text with a critical theory is called literary criticism. Traditional literary criticism focused on tracking the influence a particular text has on society, establishing the canon of major writers in the literary periods and clarifying historical context and allusions within the text. The key feature was to formulate a literary canon, books all educated persons should read, and the aims and purposes of literature. The chief functions of literary criticism are evaluation, interpretation and explanation. Literary criticism can be classified into types of criticism and phases of criticism. So we have seen what theory and criticism are and why we need to study them. Now we move on to how to study them. Students always ask the question of whether you should study theory chronologically. Not necessarily. You don't need to know one theory to understand the other. However, a chronological understanding will provide for a necessary background. When you learn a particular theory, ensure you have covered the following topics about it. The main idea of the theory, its domain, the application, the major figures, and last, the theory that contradicted it or took it forward. Another way is to understand theorists and the key words they formulated. Tabulate the terms and the theorists with the theory. Use color codes. Dedicate a color to a theory. Refer to the mnemonic strategies we discussed in our what, why and how to study history of English literature video. The same can be applied here too. Before we end today's video, here are the best books to study theory. Beginning Theory by Peter Barry to understand the basics of theory. Advanced learners of theory can read Reader's Guide to Contemporary Literary Theory or Literary Theory and Criticism. Do consider subscribing to our channel if you find our content useful. Thank you. We'll see you again with our next video. 